Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, September the 25th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to ourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. With the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Our Book of Concord reading tonight, we've finally finished Article 5, the Apology, and we are moving on to Articles 7 and 8, the Church. And what this article will deal with is the definition of what we mean by church, what the adversaries mean by church, and uh, some of the misconceptions and errors that they, they had. It begins, Our adversaries, they, have condemned Article 7 of our Confession, in which we said that the church is the congregation of saints. The adversaries have added a long essay stating that the wicked are not to be separated from the church, since John the Baptist has compared the church to a threshing floor on which wheat and chaff are heaped together. That was completely on accident that we 
heard about John the Baptist baptizing tonight, but isn't that weird how stuff like that happens? John the Baptist has compared the church to a threshing floor on which wheat and chaff are heaped together, and Christ has compared it to a net in which there are both good and bad fish. This is a true saying, there is no remedy against the attacks of the slanderer. Nothing can be spoken with such care that it can escape ridicule. For this reason we have added Article 7. Let no one think that we separate the wicked and hypocrites from the outward fellowship of the church, or that we deny the power to sacraments administered by hypocrites or wicked men. There is no need here of a long defense against this slander. Article 8 is enough to acquit us, for we grant that in this life hypocrites and wicked people have been mingled with the church, and that they are members of the church according to the outward fellowship of the signs of the church, that is, of word, profession, and sacraments, especially if they have not been excommunicated. Neither are the sacraments powerless because they are administered by wicked men. Yes, we can even be right in using the sacraments administered by wicked men. For Paul also preaches, the Antichrist takes his seat in the temple of God. In other words, he will rule and bear office in the church. But the church is not only the fellowship of outward objects and rites, as other governments, but at its core it is a fellowship of faith and of the Holy Spirit in hearts. Yet this fellowship has outward marks so that it can be recognized. These marks are the pure doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments in accordance with the gospel of Christ. This church alone is called Christ's body, which Christ renews, sanctifies, and governs by his Holy Spirit. Paul testifies about this when he says, and gave him, <clears throat> excuse me, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. Those in whom Christ does not act are not members of Christ. The adversaries admit this too. The wicked are dead members of the church. We wonder why the adversaries have found fault with our description that speaks of living members. Neither have we said anything new. Paul has defined the church precisely in the same way, that it should be cleansed in order to be holy. He adds the outward marks, the word, and the sacraments, for he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he might be that she might be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25-27 in the Confession, we have presented this sentence almost word, word for word. The Church is defined by the third article of the Creed, which teaches us to believe that there is a holy Catholic Church. The wicked indeed are not a holy Church. The words that follow, namely the communion of saints, seems to be added in order to explain what the Church signifies. The congregation of saints, who have with each other the fellowship of the same gospel or doctrine, and the same Holy Spirit, who renews, sanctifies, and governs their hearts. This article has been presented for a necessary reason. We see the infinite dangers that threaten the destruction of the church. In the church itself, the number of the wicked who oppress it is too high to count. Therefore, this article in the Creed shows us that these consolations, in order that we may not despair, but may know that the church will remain until the end of the world. No matter how great the multitude of the wicked is, we may know that the church still exists and Christ provides those gifts he has promised to the church to forgive sins, to hear prayer, to give the Holy Spirit. It says Church Catholic in order that we may not understand the Church to be an outward government of certain nations. Rather, the Church is people scattered throughout the whole world. They agree about the Gospel and have the same Christ, the same Holy Spirit, and the same sacraments, whether they have the same or different human traditions. The explanation appearing in the decrees says, The Church in its wide sense embraces good and evil. Likewise, it says that the wicked are in the church only in name, not in fact. The good are in the church both in fact and in name. To this effect, there are many passages in the Fathers. For Jerome says, The sinner, therefore, who has been soiled with any blotch cannot be called a member of Christ's church. Neither can he be said to be subject to Christ. Hypocrites and wicked people are members of this true church according to outward rites, titles, and offices. Yet when the church is defined, it is necessary to define what is the living body of Christ and what is in name and in fact the church. There are many reasons for this. We should understand what chiefly makes us members, living members, of the church. 
If we will define the church only as an outward political order of the good and wicked, people will not understand that Christ's kingdom is righteousness of heart and the gift of the Holy Spirit. See Romans 14, 17. People will conclude that the church is only the outward observance of certain forms of worship and rites. Likewise, what difference will there be between the people of the law and the church if the church is only an outward political order? But Paul distinguishes the church from the people of the law, Israel, in this way. The church is a spiritual people. It has not been distinguished from the pagans by civil rights, its polity, and civil affairs. Instead, it is God's true people, reborn by the Holy Spirit. Among the people of the law, Israel, apart from Christ's promise, even the earthly seed had promises about bodily things such as government. Even though the wicked among them were called God's people because God had separated this earthly seed from other nations by certain outward ordinances and promises, the wicked did not please God. Deuteronomy 7, 6-11 But the gospel brings not merely the shadow of eternal things, but the eternal things themselves, the Holy Spirit, and righteousness. By the gospel we are righteous before God. Only those people who receive this promise of the Spirit receive it according to the gospel. Besides, the church is Christ's kingdom, distinguished from the devil's kingdom. It is certain, however, that the wicked are in the devil's power and members of his kingdom. Paul teaches this when he says that the devil is now at work in the sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Christ says to the Pharisees, who certainly had outward fellowship with the church, that is, with the saints among the people of the law, as office holders, sacrificers, and teachers, you are of your father the devil, John 8.44. Therefore, the church, which is truly Christ's kingdom, is properly the congregation of saints. For the wicked are ruled by the devil and are captives of the devil. They are not ruled by the Spirit of Christ. Why say more when the matter is clear? If the church, which is truly Christ's kingdom, is distinguished from the devil's kingdom, it follows necessarily that the wicked are not the church, since they are in the devil's kingdom. It is true that, because Christ's kingdom has not yet been revealed, the wicked are mixed in with the church and hold offices. And that is where we'll, where we'll stop for tonight. Uh, just one point of clarification, uh, the way to think about the church that we sometimes talk about, that you may find helpful listening to this article because it can get a little confusing uh, and a little repetitive sometimes too, is to think of the church invisible and the church visible. So the church visible is everybody that claims to be a Christian, that claims to be a member of the church, uh, that we can see. We can see you are in church. That's literally the church visible. The church invisible is the truly uh, true believers, the ones that are truly saved, that are truly uh, children of Christ. So even mixed in with all of those true believers, you have the hypocrites and those that don't really believe and they're just kind of going along for the show, but we can't see into their hearts. So they are members of the church visible, but the truly saved are members of what we call the church invisible, that only, only God can see into hearts and see who are the members of the church invisible, which is why we call it invisible. Uh, so if you make that distinguishment that way, when we're talking about you know, the visible church, you're talking about everybody that's in there, the believers, the non-believers, the hypocrites, uh, those that think they're saved because of what they do, and people who uh, think know that they're saved because of what Christ did for us. And we'll probably be talking more about that as these articles go on. But that's just a good distinction to uh, to keep in mind so that you can keep straight these two kind of groups that they're talking about in this article. Because it does get a little repetitive and a little confusing and you can kind of lose track of what group we're actually talking about sometimes. Okay, well with that we'll pick that up on Monday. And now we will join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as always on Fridays, our Friday prayer focuses on Christ's passion. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin, you were counted a sinner and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst, you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit so that you could pay our debts and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy, bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times it, this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.